We're going to move on to the next uh, next agenda point, I, uh, uh, agenda point, which is soft power leadership in a shaky world. And to do that, I'm really happy to introduce to the stage Andrew Tuck, editor in chief, Monocle, and Stefan Stefan Ingveson, CEO of Stockholm Business Region. Welcome. Welcome to both of you. So after this morning's uh, really deep discussions, I think the question of what actually happens to soft power in a world where rhetorics are getting tougher is uh, extremely relevant. And I thought we would start from Andrew. I know that your, your uh, monocle, they do a, um, an index every year. And in a couple of days, you will release the updated ones. So we're all very curious. I know you will give us some highlights from that. But before we go into that, maybe you want to talk about how do you define the soft? What is soft power, actually? Well, how would you want the audience to look at that? Well, thank you. I didn't bring any boxes with me. I should have, because this is the issue that's going to be out <laughs> in the next couple of days. I think I could maybe sold a couple of hundred copies over lunch. Um, for us, soft power is about all of those things that we think about. It's about diplomacy. It's about how well your ambassadors act around the world. It's about less considered things maybe by central government, the power of pop stars, the, the value of your film industry, how you get people to think about your country. But I also must say that it's a lot about this as well. It's about often the most common touch point that anybody has with your national brand is your business brands. These, these are the ways that we, we understand what a country stands for and represents. And I'd say that, you know, there's, there's two tiers to this. There's what, what we think is government organizations about the power of, uh, of softness and, and how that's used. But I'd say for the average British person, for example, it's, it is going to IKEA. It is having, a, mm. it is having meatballs on a Saturday when you're there with the kids. Strangely, those things shouldn't be ignored as well. That is also soft power. That is also how we think about countries. Mm. Interesting. And is, is there always an opposite, though? So if, if there's more hard power coming, do we see the soft power diminishing? No, but I think, let's be honest, in the past 12 months, we've all learned the, the limitations of soft power. Soft power shouldn't be seen as icing on the cake of you know, your armaments and your, your armies and, and your military might. But without a doubt, we've learned over the past year, it's hard to imagine the two just sitting side by side and not interacting. So just this week, we've had the, 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 the first lady of Ukraine here that was a soft power move. She's here talking about her country in, with, in an eloquent way. She represents her nation. And you know what Ukraine has done over the past year has been an extraordinary move of soft power. If you had said to British people two years ago, what's the difference between, I don't know, Belarus and Ukraine, they couldn't have given mm. you, the, the person in the street could not have given you any answer to that. Now they can tell you. They, they know where those countries uh, main cities are on, on the map, they understand the language, they, they, they've, they've met Ukrainian people, they've seen them on television, but they've seen the likes of the First Lady talking about what, Ukrainian, what Ukraine stands for. So let's not imagine the two are separate, but it, when you mix them together, they can be extraordinarily potent. Mm. Interesting. So speaking about Ukraine, because I think there has been a change in your top 25 countries. What, what can you share with us that we will all be able to read on, on Monday on, on the shifts you're seeing? Well, for the first time ever, Ukraine, we have ranked it in the past 12 months as one of the top 10 players mm -hmm. in the use of soft power. A, a, an extraordinary rise for a country like that. But also, it's an interesting thing because, you know, Sweden, especially at the moment, uh, globally, maybe there's some questions about politics have risen more up to the front pages of our newspapers, for example, around the world. But we've tried to divorce. It's, it's not just about who your prime minister is or who your leaders are or which political party is on, on the up. That, of course, plays into your soft power. But we've also looked at why, for example, the US is still so successful around the world as a soft power agent, even if in many places, perhaps Mr. Biden isn't liked everywhere. And the last thing on this, because I must allow Stefan, <laughs> is just let me just say, I think there is also a very fascinating story that's happened over the 12 months, which is the polarization of soft power. So maybe two years ago, you could have sent the Bolshoi around the world and they could have turned up in Washington, they could have turned up in London. 
and we would have been eased back into a Russian world and we'd have thought that was, was great. You could have sent maybe somebody, a pop singer from Sweden to tour in Moscow mm -hmm. and it would have worked. Yeah. Now we're in a much more polar world and actually some of these soft power influences are just not traveling. They're, they're coming up against barriers. Mm. So soft power is working much more in orbits than it ever has before. Thank you so much. So before we move to Stefan, what happened to Sweden then uh, from last year? Well, I'm afraid, <laughs> index. I'm afraid Sweden has gone down in our, in our ranking. I wouldn't say that's because of politics. I would say it's, it's to, to do with questions that you'd see here in the UK as well. So many European countries look to all of the Nordics, especially Sweden, for this extraordinary experiment in social democracy. It was seen as a miracle cure for people arriving from other nations and being rapidly absorbed into a country, that you would have a, a, a low crime rate, a, a peaceful nation at all times. Now, that's nothing against Sweden. That you, with all, all countries around Europe are coming up against the, 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 these, these, these same walls and same concerns. How do you integrate people? But unfortunately for Sweden, that has, that has knocked, we put aside the crime figures or the, the shootings or the gang violence, which is, is certainly dominating headlines in many newspapers. But it's the, this soft power side of it, the brand of social democracy. It's less sellable, I think, at this point around the world. You know, even, even under Prime Minister Cameron, he went to Sweden to see how we could be a bit more like you. And I think, unfortunately, I think it's unlikely that you would see, say, Mr. Sunak saying, OK, we need to go to Stockholm, we need to go to Gothenburg to understand how to run our society better at this point. Thank you. So I think this is a perfect switch to, to Stefan. Is this, are you seeing... Are you seeing this? Are people less interesting in, in being inspired by Sweden, influenced by Sweden, or, or uh, how we have tended maybe to create our society and, and, and lives? Yes and no, I think. Uh, the topic is how do soft power evolve in a shaky world? And I would say in a shaky world, the hard powers becomes more important uh, as well. Uh, what we see very clearly is the great interest in investing in the Stockholm region. Uh, there's a lot of capital looking to, to find solutions there. And when we work a lot with the tech sector, we work a lot with the life science sector, a lot with the uh, various industries that are targeting the uh, strategic development goals, there's a lot of interest there. In uh, verticals there, we can be really front runners. Mm -hmm. I think as a society as a whole, uh, you, you are correct that the, the image of Sweden, so to speak, has has uh, been, been uh, a, a bit tarnished in, in this. Uh, and yes, but at the same time, Stockholm today and Sweden today is something else that it was 10, 15 years ago. Uh, we are now less than a, less a niche country, a niche city, more of a, of a larger global actor, I would say. Uh, and that also means that a lot of the problems that we have and share with a lot of the, the cities around the world, they are there and we have to address them. So, yes, I think you are correct that the, our soft power, the lure of, of Sweden, may have diminished a, a bit. But at the same time, we have proven that we are in the forefront when it comes to, to technology, to life science, to a, quite solving quite a few of the, um, the climate change uh, problems that we have. So it varies a bit. How do you look at it, I would hmm. say? I'd just be nice, yeah. to, to Stefan. I, I don't know that tarnished <laughs> is the word. That I, it's certainly not the word I would use. It, it, I would put a question mark, and I think that for a lot, lots of us, you know, the soft power values of our nations have had little question marks put next to them. You know, here in the UK, we know all the things that happened. Let's not go through those arguments. But oddly, when we saw the death of our monarch, I think British people were surprised that actually the potency of British soft power was was kind of like a bedrock that we hadn't quite noticed. It had been covered up by all this kind of chaotic news. And I would say the same for most countries, that consistent investment in the world of soft power allows you in moments of crisis not to panic. It's to come back to the fact that actually we will continue to invest in cinema, in architecture, in design. We will still be best of class when it comes to the life sciences. And you can come back to those things. So th th there's a turmoil that goes on the top, but don't think that that tarnishes it permanently. It's just, it just pulls the rug under you a little mm. bit. Mm. Interesting. Any, I should have said that, of course. Any questions? 
comments from the from the floor. Please jump in. Um, and I think there's um, is there uh, you you mentioned Stockholm and Sweden in, in a combination somehow stuff. Are we is it is it a, are we seeing more polarization between the countries and cities as well, or is it is it? Uh, yeah, but I think I think we have quite say. quite a few examples around the world where uh, look at the U.S. when when Donald Trump was president and the the way that New York tried to position themselves in that context. Of course, we have, we have the mayor of Warsaw uh, and and the Polish government. There is a, there is a, mm. could be friction uh, here, not just uh, out of maybe different political uh, parties, but also because you have uh, a divide between the, the larger cities and the countryside in, in all European countries, really, in the UK, for, for sure, in Sweden as well. So th there is a tension there. And when we work uh, we, in promoting Stockholm for, for tourists or for, for entrepreneurs, for investors, of course, we work very closely to the national level in this. But it's not always easy to do so. And we, and we have to work on that relationship because in, in, the, in the very much globalized world, I think that smaller countries as, as Sweden. We have to work with the strengths that we have, both in, in Stockholm, in Gothenburg, in Skåne, and the national level more closely together to be able to just come true in the, in the media bus. So yeah, there is a friction both in, in essence, I would say, but also in how we communicate and what kind of perception we want to have. Mm. And there's a good example there with, with Poland, for example, uh, Traskowski, the, the mayor of, of Warsaw, he did a, a good thing during the, the crisis w w that we have with Ukraine. Instead of waiting for central government to give him funds to house people, to look after Ukrainians coming to the city, he got on a plane and he went to Washington, D.C. And he, he tapped into the Polish expat community to government institutions in, in D.C. And he raised more money there than he did in Warsaw. And he, he came back with that cash and was able to do good things. So you can have this free-floating kind of uh, soft power for your, for your city. But in the end, if you're, if you're in government, if you're in an agency, you, surely you want it to be kind of aligned and that you are selling your nation in a, a mm. more interesting way. Mm. I, I think to, to connect, connect to a discussion that we had earlier this morning as well, uh, the, the, uh, not the rebirth of democracy, but the fact that we, we look at democracy on another uh, not a uh, see now after the war in uh, with, with the war in Ukraine. I think that Europe has a potential uh, in that sense as well in a soft power uh, dimension uh, to be really true to our, our core values. We can take that position and actually also make something good out out of it. But Stefan, tell me when you go and sell Stockholm around the world. Mm -hmm. I understand the investment points and and you can give people a good tax regime and find the land for them. But what are the, 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 the softer points of, of life in Stockholm that when somebody comes to you from another nation, you say, actually, if you move to Stockholm, I think we can deliver this for you as well, for your, for your staff, for your families, if they, they move here? I think, I think it was, uh, was, was uh, either it was an Australian or a British newspaper, I can't remember right now, that said that uh, Stockholm is the Nordic, but in an urban setting. That's good. And uh, there's a lot of soft power <laughs> in that. Uh, and true, uh, I would say. But also uh, what we are selling is talent, talent and talent. Uh, the fact that Stockholm has a startup ecosystem that is uh, really up there and globally, that we have a lot of, of good talent, uh, that is what is selling. The reason you want to be in Stockholm is that you meet uh, the people that will uh, shape the future. So, of course, yeah, the hard infrastructure is there. There is, uh, there is capital, there is various types of, of infrastructure that you need. There are political stability, the rule of law, and so on and so forth. But Everybody else, or not everybody else, but a lot of other places has that. What we have is uh, a very, very good talent base. Uh, and that is what we are selling to. And Helen, you, we should say that this is soft power, what's going on in this room. You're bringing people together to think about what Sweden represents is important. And, you know, and I'd say that another best in class thing about here in London is that you have a great ambassador who uses the embassy in interesting ways to bring people mm. through the front door. We have also a story in this issue, and I hope there's not too many Finns in the room, because they are moving to a policy where, in, for example, in Islamabad, they're not going to have an embassy anymore. They don't think it's necessary. They're moving into a, a business park, and they'll have three desks for, for briefcase di diplomats. Cool, it saves lots of money, it looks funky. But actually, the power of being together, the power of having a great building, knowing how to use it, of course, you can have millions of pounds worth of real estate that you fail to use in interesting ways because you're crap at putting on a design show or you forget to invite people to come through the front door. <laughs> but if you do do those things, then the role of this, the diplomatic, the, 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 the trade mission 
is, is phenomenal. You can change how people think about your city. And we see that through, through the magazine, through people we meet, through, through business. If there's a good ambassador who sits in this city, they will change the narrative about what we think about your, your home mm. country. Mm. That's, that's fascinating, and that the narrative is making such a difference. We have talked a lot about Sweden. So what, what happens to you, uh, UK soft power with all the shifts that we saw in the UK? Well, as I said, there's this, this bedrock that, first of all, you have to go back to. If you strip away all of the terrible news stories, the, the chaos of, of Brexit, all of, these, all of these things, if you go back to that bedrock, what sits there? And the, the extraordinary thing is that, you know, Hopefully, there is something that sits under there that still people believe in and they want to be part of. Now, we run a company that's dependent on having many people in the office in the room who are not British. We're a European magazine headquartered here in London. <coughs> and you know, after Brexit, we, we lost people who felt they didn't want to stay. They, they didn't feel that there, there, there was something about the UK that wasn't right. I would say that we are attracting talent back in, a, in an interesting way. And I see that across the city, that, that this still remains an international city and an actually quite an international nation as well. So the pockets of what's happened for years in London are definitely now happening in other cities around the UK. So I think for those things. But I would say, you know, we've, we've had the, the worst political landscape that you can imagine for the last year. And it's hit us. And, it's, and, and Brexit has hit us. So you know the the the, the when you, the embarrassing thing for for me as a journalist is the number of times you 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 go and meet somebody in a government ministry or you go and see somebody who's the head of a delegation and the first thing they say is I'm sorry and and that 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 shows you the wobble of soft power people say I'm really sorry what's happening in your country how you know, and you think this you know we were a big meeting when we had uh, Liz Truss as a as a fleeting presence as uh, our prime minister. And we met somebody who runs a very huge corporation. And he said, we've, um, uh, an American based here in the UK. And he said, we've had a discussion today about the UK that we normally have about developing nations. Mm. Now, he, he wasn't being rude, he wasn't being flippant, but the, when those conversations start, the, the storm that sits above the bedrock yeah. is, is painful for British people. But you have to hope that there is a way out. And, and we do do good things. We have, we have an extraordinary cultural presence still around the world that people want to be part of. Uh, I think you missed the, 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 uh, one of the sessions earlier, but the president of Swedbank, he was saying, please, please come back to the, to the EU. <laughs> there was a plead for that. Well, you don't have to plead with me because <laughs> I've done everything I can personally to uh, go back. But... Uh, uh, I, I, I do think that has been a, a, a jolt for people, but we have to come through it. it, it yeah. It's happened. And, and what, what is on the other side? And as I said, these strange moments where the clouds break and you suddenly see people looking at something else to do with Britain. And th that did happen with the, with the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Mm -hmm. you know, a, a colleague at work said, um, said he went to see the, 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 um, the, the funeral procession and he was standing in a group <clears throat> of people and they were waiting there for hours. And he got speaking to people. Mm -hmm. And out, out of 30 people, he was the only person from the UK. There were people who had flown in from Lima, from flown in from Washington to DC. And the conversation was, wasn't, was about why they, they felt this was such a hmm. defining moment, a piece, of, a piece of British history that they wanted to be part of. But we have to hope again and again and again that what we stand for is not just embedded in an individual person, but is in our institutions and in our, in our cultural nows. So we, 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 and you we, will have, have some support, hope. I think, from everybody in this room. We're going to go over to this. Uh, we have a question here, I think. Uh, or uh, I just wanted to add to what Stefan was uh, talking about, what you asked about what, what values, what, what the strong things with Stockholm is. And I think what we attract talent to Stockholm is also that we have such a wonderful social security system in Sweden with parental leave, which gives uh, opportunity for families to settle in Sweden, actually to have a good lifestyle. Mm. And uh, of course, uh, the nature and the, the beauty and the water and the green areas and the, the openness of Swedish uh, society, the equality. I, I just wanted to add that. Yeah. Yeah, that adds to the attraction, I think. Anything else from the audience? I uh, just, just say, I yes. don't, I don't yes. disagree with that <laughs> at all. I think that, but, that, but how do you, 
how do you throw those things out? That, that's, that's, that's the problem with soft power. It, it's, it's great when it's, it's, it's polished and it's perfect at home, but how do you throw it out there? You know, the, 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 now I hope my Finnish friends are in the room. The, the Finns were, uh, uh, made a good stab at exporting their education system around the world, and now they've been so successful that lots of people are calling it the Finnish school, although it has nothing to do with Finland. It, it, it's become a brand Yep. Finnish education. Mm. So, how do you take this this notion of of of, of childcare, of of mater, uh, paternity leave and uh, maternity leave, and export it, make it something seem desirable? Because I think that's the way that you can be powerful. Is you can start that conversation here. Because mm. I, I think there's quite a few people I think that's in my a really office. Good point, like how this. to package that in a yeah. way that yeah, and I think that is quite unique. <laughs> Um, uh, we're running out of time, but I wanted to ask you both from a perspective of that soft power leadership. Is there reason for optimism in the next couple of years? You think? Well, definitely. I think I think you have to have the hard uh, the hard power stuff in order. Um, that is very true. But I think that in in the growing competition in, within the European framework, I think yes, of course, there is uh, there is a room for this. And I think what you what you are showing now also with Ukraine is that how important this is mm. to to make it possible also for the. I think that the dialogue that we are facing the, com- the coming years, hopefully facing the coming years of Ukraine joining the European Union, is because a lot of this discussion we're having now about the soft power of Ukraine. And also it can turn on a dime. We've just had a, 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 a delegation of our, our journalists uh, up, up at COP there for the, the talks. And they said that one of the most fascinating things was how Brazil had gone from being the, 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 the country that nobody wanted to talk to and everybody thought was a disaster and they were destroying the rainforest to you just needed yeah. a few people to turn up and talk common sense and re-engage with the the notion of soft power. And in the second, the conversation, the narrative changes. Thank you for leaving both of you on a hopeful note. So uh, thanks so much for your uh, contribution here on stage.